talk about gender, gender equity, power structures, and restricted power. Thanks very much, Peter. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm sorry it's taken me two years to make it all the way up to the top here and, uh, and uh, uh, see the math department, but I'm glad that I'm getting a chance to spend a bit of time with you. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that we'll be able to have a conversation. I certainly have things that, it, that uh, I want to, uh, to introduce but I will welcome questions, especially at the end, but there could be questions uh, in the middle as well. I like to start by asking, why are we here? Why are we here today? I'm here, I got interested in this topic um, because while you see that I'm, uh, you know, I'm distinguished professor of physics and I'm executive vice chancellor and, and all of that, um, you know, I started out as a student as a graduate student and through my years uh, in a field that, uh, like yours, doesn't have an overabundance of women, especially back when I was a student and coming up through the ranks, um, I have encountered my, my share of um, sexism and harassment and bias. Um, in my case, the only thing that makes me a minority in physics is my gender. I'm white, I'm cis, I'm straight, I'm from an uh, you know, an affluent enough family that paying for college wasn't an issue for me. So in all those ways, I'm very typical in physics. But as a woman, I'm not. And I know that many of my colleagues have experienced um, harassment and bias and prejudice on account of other personal characteristics that they might have because gender isn't the only uh, realm where this happens. And um, so while this talk will focus mostly on gender, I will bring in other elements as I'm, as I'm able to. So that's why I'm interested in these issues and talking about them because I first got interested because of my personal experience and then I realized we ought to be able to do something about that so that the next generation has a better experience and overall we keep the most talented people possible in our fields in STEM. So because I'm a physicist, I will be um, talking a lot about data from physics, but it's not exclusively from physics. And uh, there are a lot of similarities across many of the um, STEM fields, particularly those in the physical sciences. So that's, that's why I'm here and I hope we're here for a conversation. But one should start by saying, well, where exactly are we? And so we'll start with some data, starting in gender. So this is data from the uh, American Institute of Physics Statistical Research Center, and they collect an awful lot of data and put out reports handily on the web. And this shows um, the uh, percentage of bachelor's degrees earned by women in physics, so the percentage of all bachelor's degrees in physics earned that were earned by women, and also in uh, blue, then in gold for PhDs over a span of years starting in about 1977 and just up to 2017. And you can see that uh, women are in the distinct minority earning both kinds of degrees and there has been a climb over the years though the bachelor's degrees then declined around, uh, again and uh, we're now at about 20% of the degrees earned are earned by women. If you look a little bit more in detail, this is just for bachelor's degrees. And the total now is in blue, and degrees earned by women is in gold. You see that the head count, just the number of degrees being earned by women, has been slowly, slowly creeping up over the years. But the huge fluctuation in the total is because the rate at which men were interested in earning uh, bachelor's degrees in physics evidently fluctuated uh, quite a bit. Now, if you look at the graduate degrees, you see a, a sort of similar pattern. The head count for women creeping up slowly over the years and the total having quite a bit of fluctuation. So this is data for physics, but of course there is data, uh, for example, PhDs earned uh, in, by, by women in a whole variety of fields. Mathematics is in the pale blue, so topping out now at about 30% of the PhDs earned, uh, being earned by women. Physics is the really pathetic uh, line uh, or, or sort of squiggle down at the bottom in green. 
So um, there we are. We used to be able to say that uh, engineering was doing worse than we were, but no longer. We have raced to the bottom in my field. And you can see that um, the life sciences, it's quite different. Really, half the PhDs are being earned, are being earned by, uh, by women, um, more than half, in fact. Um, so there are, um, you can, so you can see that there are, there are some similarities. There's some differences in detail, but there's still some similarities between our fields. Now, of course, earning the PhD is not the end of the story. People go on and get, uh, go on and get faculty jobs. And so you can see, uh, here is the percentage of positions held by women at different ranks in physics departments. And you can see that uh, percentage of full professors is still 10%. Even at a time when now assistant, and assi assistant professors and, uh, and uh, instructors are now kind of on par with the rate of earning the PhD at about 23%, going up through the ranks, getting the full professor, clearly there's, there's, uh, there's still a barrier there. And that's, that's persisted for a really long time. The lag has been there for a really long time. But if you think about that, if you think about what the experience of that 10% is in their daily lives, so here is some, here's some data on, um, just departments that uh, offer the PhD. So there are about 190 of them in the US, and average, you know, the size is about 30 people. And this compares data in blue from 2002, in gold from 2014. And what you're being shown is the percentage of physics departments on the vertical axis that have zero or one or two and so forth women on their faculty out of that about 30 faculty in the department. And you can see that back in uh, 2002, most departments had zero or one women on their physics faculty. And that has changed over time. The curve, the gold curve is definitely shifted towards higher numbers. However, still three or fewer are, is, by, is clearly the more typical pattern out of a faculty of 30. So that, that sort of 10%, it means in your daily life, when you are um, in uh, you know, meeting with a, a committee about curriculum or getting together to discuss graduate students or what have you, you're probably the only woman in the room most of your day, in fact. There may be three of you in the department, but how often are you actually, are there multiple women in the room? Not necessarily so often. And so the experience, is a little bit different than, than the number three in the department might be suggesting. So now one thing that, um, one thing I should mention here is that I've been talking strictly in terms of um, binary gender, just men and women. I know that the gender spectrum is much more varied than that. The data that I have available tends to be almost exclusively done in terms of binary gender um, I, have some, I have some data that goes beyond that, and I will get to that. But I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to say that. But as I alluded to at the very beginning, gender is not the only axis along which we should think about uh, diversity and inclusion. And so if we look at, um, if we look at race, um, again, AIP statistics, this is looking at the um, number. This is not percentage. This is number of degrees in physics being earned by um, African American women in blue or Hispanic American women bachelor's degrees over time from 1995 to 2016. The story for Hispanic American women looks like really um, triumphalist. Look, the numbers are going up and up. The story for African American women, it's really sad. It says something very sad about my field. Not that my field is alone, but um, really, we should have we should have been doing better. We shouldn't have been doing worse over time. And if you go, so this is um, earning the bachelor's degree. So if you go back to 2016, there were let's see, there were 400 women overall earning uh, earning. Bachelor, let's see, oh, excuse me, that was PhD. So they're um, sh just shy of 2,000 and total just shy of 9,000. 
And so you can see then out of that 2,000, you've got uh, you know, 60 if you're a little generous. And if you go to faculty here, and this is uh, divided out by uh, departments that grant the bachelor's is the highest degree, master's is the highest degree, or doctoral granting departments like ours here. And this shows a uh, number of women faculty for three different years in the three different columns. The different colors relate to different racial or ethnic identities. And if you look at the 2016 numbers, so overall, um, uh, looking, looking at the total, you would expect that um, uh, by the population of the U.S., just saying that uh, population of the U.S., so, sort of, you know, 13, 15 percent African American. So you would have expected 70 to 100 of the faculty to be African American instead of 14. So again, the data is showing there's clearly a problem here because that's, this is just not what you would expect based on based on the population. Um, so this shows that there's, um, there are real questions that we have to ask about what's going on in the field. And then going to um, questions around uh, gender identity and sexual orientation, the uh, American Physical Society asked a group of us to serve as an ad hoc committee on uh, climate for LGBT individuals in physics. Um, no data had ever been collected on this because a lot of data gathering is driven by federal requirements and the federal government gathers data strictly along binary gender and is, does rigorously does not collect data on uh, sexual orientation even though people uh, periodically request that the government do so, the government does not. So there wasn't data, so the APS asked us to uh, to get some data, to gather some data, and to make a report. And so we gathered both qualitative and quantitative data. We did our own survey research, and we also got some, uh, we got the Physical Society to include some demographic questions in their standard um, survey of the membership, and uh, wrote a report. And I'll just indicate a couple of our key findings to you that, that uh, I think show the what, what people are encountering. So one thing that comes out very clearly here is that um, the idea of intersectionality. That is, we all have multiple identities, right? We have, um, uh, you know, I'm a woman, and I'm white, and I'm straight. These are all parts of, of my dem demographics, and they're part of my experience in society. So people who identify in multiple ways that tend to put them in the minority in a particular situation, then are more likely to encounter harassment or bias or things like this because there are more axes along which that might be happening. And this came out really clearly in our data. If you look at the, um, so, uh, the data on um, people who are made to feel uncomfortable in the workplace based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, then for LGBT individuals who identified as men and presented as men, 15% were experiencing this. Women, who are also then a gender minority as, um, uh, in, in, uh, in physics, the percentage goes up. And those who identified as gender nonconforming, which might include people who present as androgynous or people who identify as non-binary, for example, 30%. Um, and the same pattern in uh, those who have observed harassment based on gender identity and sexual orientation in the, in the department or the workplace, the same pattern is there. And so, so you're saying that why do many people observe harassment tend to be uncomfortable? So clearly observing harassment is not enough to feel uncomfortable. This is have personally been yeah, made to no, feel but, attacked but or, well, right. <laughs> That's right. It shows a, a remarkably forgiving spirit. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. So this then, having seen this, then the, um, 
there were additional results um, showing that, um, that not surprisingly, people felt a lot of pressure to stay closeted if they were members of the LGBT community in a physics department or a government uh, setting or, or industry. They weren't all academics. Um, uh, pressure to stay closeted. And then um, over a third had within the last year at the time of the survey really seriously considered leaving their workplace or leaving their educational program. And these were people who were grad students, postdocs, or faculty or staff scientists, people who'd invested years of their lives and were highly talented, highly trained. And they were experiencing stuff that was bad enough that it was really pressuring them to get out of the field. And we were very disturbed by that. So we um, worked with the American Physical Society to get some changes made in the field. And we're, we're trying. The, the Physical Society is, is going to try to work on this in various ways that I'll, that I'll come back to. But this is all part of then saying, so, um, so why are we here? We now know where we are. And it's not necessarily the most comfortable place to be because, wow, quite a lot of people are finding the field and the data is from physics, but I don't think it's really so unique. Um, how did we get here? I don't think most of us come to work every day saying, wow, how can I make other people's lives miserable? Right? How did we get here? And there's a lot of social science research on this kind of thing. And so I'm going to give a very brief summary of some of that research to, that gives a sense of factors that lead us without meaning to. And I say us because me too. All of us um, help create these climates that are, that are not as hospitable as the climates we would really like to be creating for our colleagues. So uh, a lot of this has to do with what's called implicit bias, unconscious bias. Um, and so as I, as I walk here and as I'm talking, um, I am doing a number of things at once. So I'm, I'm walking around, I'm talking, I'm choosing words, I'm choosing concepts. And some of these things I'm doing consciously, right? I'm using the, um, the uh, conscious part of my brain to pick what am I going to say to you and probably the patterns of the words. But I'm not using my conscious brain. It's, it's the hind brain, the unconscious part, really the, the part that you know, lizards have too. They keep me breathing. They keep me walking. I don't really think literally about doing that. I simply do that automatically. But there's an intermediate part where I've decided what I'm going to say, but the, the exact words, there's a pattern recognition and a, and a sort of a pattern identified part of the brain that's helping me with the flow of words. It's also helping me identify that this is a table and that this is a table, and that this is also a table even though it's a different shape. And I'm not having to think rigorously through and examine whether those are all tables. The, what's called the adaptive unconscious, the part of the brain that does pattern recognition, is helping me with that, which is a super help to get through the day. And it's a big help to get through the speech without picking out every single word I'm going to say to you. But it also causes problems for us because Sometimes we recognize patterns such as we think, oh, look, I recognize this person is a man or this person is a woman. And that's, you know, that, that can be useful in certain situations. The problem is that the brain, in a sense, doesn't know when to stop associating things and, and building out the pattern. And so because of the society we've, we've grown up in, we associate um, characteristics and proclivities for uh, academic aptitude or job aptitude and all sorts of things with those labels, man or woman. And so our brain is attaching that to the individuals we meet, whether or not those things really actually attach to those individuals. Maybe that man really um, is interested in certain things that stereotypically our society tells us more women would be interested in. But the brain isn't telling that. We're, we're just making, we're making assumptions. And um, this tends to impact decisions we make because we make decisions all the time about um, 
which student we're going to, uh, which student we're going to support, who we're going to put up for that promotion, who we're going to choose for that scholarship. And if we're not aware that we carry these unconscious biases in, in our minds, in this sort of pattern recognition part of our mind, they can impact the decisions we're making without our realizing it, without our meaning to. And so there are lots of books on these sorts of things. Uh, Strangers to Ourselves is about the adaptive unconscious. Uh, Whistling Vivaldi, a, great, uh, a really great book about what stereotypes um, do uh, to our decision making and so on. And this turns out to have an impact um, even, even right here in our own fields where we think that we're, we're very, um, really try to be very rational about things. And so there were some, uh, there was uh, some interesting research done looking at, looking at um, how, uh, to what extent do people in different fields believe that success in that field depends on being born with a special talent for that field, with just having an innate aptitude, something that can't really be learned. And it turns out that if you compare that with the percentage of women who hold PhDs in that field, there's a really interesting pattern. In physics, I've circled, well, math, math is up here in a, in, in a slightly different place. But this, at this end, it's greater prevalence among practitioners in the field of believing that, yeah, to be in my field takes a special inborn talent. It can't be learned and can't be gathered through, through practice or effort. And then you look at the interesting trend against a uh, percentage of PhD holders. And you say, wow, look at, look at physics out there, math. You know, you're, you're kind of out there with us. But I'd like to ask you, um, how many of you have ever taken a course in mathematics? <laughs> Me too, right? How many of you have ever taught a course in mathematics? So if we really believed this, why would, be, why would we be wasting our time, <laughs> right? And so this is an example of something that, you know, when you're asked on a survey, you know, your gut reaction is, oh, yeah, you know, you've really, you know, you've really got to be a born physicist. But obviously, we don't really think that with the logical parts of our mind, or we wouldn't be here in academe in the first place. And so that disconnect between what our, our, our guts or our, the uh, adaptive unconscious is, is uh, leading us to act according to isn't necessarily what we would think rationally. And so when, um, when we're at these points where we're making decisions about people and about, um, about hiring awards and so on, we need to be really careful to make sure we're using the logical, conscious parts of our minds to make the decisions. And that's why using things like using things like um, uh, rubrics and being very careful about how exactly are we making our decisions, what criteria are we using, because those pull our conscious mind back into it and make sure that our, our, our unconscious bias isn't pulling us off course in a way we didn't mean to. And so there are all sorts of ways that one can, one can work to counter implicit bias. The slides will be available to you. I don't have to go through, uh, I wasn't going to go through line by line. I should also mention that the last two slides of the talk have further reading and resources uh, as well. So I wanted to mention um, uh, another, another place where this shows up is negotiation. So negotiation is something we all have to do all the time. It's not only when you're uh, trying to get a job, we have to negotiate um, Who's going to get which? Who's going to teach which classes which quarter? Um, who's going to be in which office space? There are all, there are all sorts of things that come up, and it turns out that social science research shows. Um, and Linda Babcock, one of the authors of this work, actually came and spoke on campus. I think it was a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, um, about this and some related work. And it turns out that uh, in in our society here, um, uh, and this is, this is true more broadly though. Uh, women tend to avoid entering into negotiations because we've been socialized to avoid confrontation and to worry about not wanting to break the relationship with the other person. And so we've been socialized not to fight for ourselves, to fight for other people. And all of these things make, make women 
uh, less likely to enter into a negotiation or recognize when there's a possibility for one. But interestingly, at the same time, when women do enter into negotiation, turns out we're more likely to use the approach called interest-based negotiation that tends to lead to a better outcome for everybody. So there's position-based negotiation would be if, if I were to say, um, uh, if I were to come along and say, um, you know, I've got to sit right here. You, you've got to get out of your seat, and I, I need to have this chair. It's the only place I can sit. Whereas interest-based would be if I came and said, hey, could you help me find a place to see, sit so I can join the audience? And then we'd look around together and kind of find a solution that would work for everybody. And it turns out that um, when women do negotiate, they're more likely to use this approach. So it's, possibil it's possible for women to negotiate well when our societal acculturation isn't getting in our way. And so again, there, there are then solutions to how to teach. And this, day, this research was done, um, again, looking at, at men versus women. But I think that there are plenty of people of all genders out there who maybe aren't comfortable with negotiation, particularly if they think it has to be the kick the other person out of their chair kind of negotiation. So I think this is broader. I, um, I found this last solution really effective. Um, and uh, I started doing that when I, when I first became a dean and I made my first hires. Um, I'm sitting across the table from the uh, person who wants to be an assistant professor and we're trying to negotiate the terms and I'd never been the dean before and they'd never tried to get a faculty job before so we were on equal footing. Three years later, I realized I knew how this was done but the person on the other side of the table still had no clue because they were a new person. And I realized this was getting in the way of what we both wanted, which was to arrange something that would help them be able to come and do their job. So I wrote up a tip sheet and then it turned into a, a published article and I started giving it to the people before they would come meet with me. I'd say, read this so you'll know what the conversation is about. It's not adversarial. Uh, come with a list of things that you want to discuss. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll both try to do our best for you. And it made such a difference. The conversations became much more productive by teaching them a little bit about how to negotiate. So, so there are ways to make progress on this. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the bit about, uh, so we've been, what, where are we? How did we get here? Um, and the next, the next thing I'd like to talk about is then how this, how this then ties into academic leadership. But let me first see, are there any burning questions out there before I go on to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the other part? Yes, in the back. So um, what, the, what the data definitely shows is that when any individual acts against what we have been culturally conditioned to expect they would act like, there, there's, there's a negative pushback. So if a woman acts um, very assertive and aggressive, that's seen as against cultural norms and there's a bad reaction. But if men act in ways that are publicly in ways that are very nurturing, or something, for example, which can be against a cultural norm, they can get bad pushback. So it, it, it impacts all of us in different ways. So, so yes. Um, and um, I myself encountered this uh, years ago, um, uh, again, when I, when I was a dean at another institution, and a, um, a woman faculty member in one appointment series came to me and said, you know, if you look at my CV, I really think that I should transition to a different appointment series. Um, from uh, this was uh, from uh, non-ladder rank to ladder rank, and I found myself feeling very irritated by this, and and I wasn't comfortable with this conversation. And then I thought to myself, why am I uncomfortable with this conversation? Her CV is spectacular. 
she really has a point. This you know, ought to go through the personnel process, and go through all the regular process. Why am I so irritated? In fact, a couple years ago, a guy came to me with the same issue, and I wasn't irritated. And then I had to say, oh dear, you know, she was being professionally, appropriately assertive. And here I am reacting differently because it's a woman. And so, thank goodness, I recognized it in time and set it aside. And she, she uh, went through the process and became ladder rank. But it's, you know, it's really startling when you realize you're, you're doing this. You're letting your, your, your gut or your societal conditioning take over. Um, and uh, we, all, we all encounter it. Um, and it's only by continually watching for it and trying to be our best selves always that we can keep this from derailing our efforts to make things work well for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let me just let me just go back to it. Is it running one? Uh, there we go. Let's see. This is this is NSF data. I think that is. I think that's STEM fields. Okay. I believe. I yeah. think this. I think this is NSF data. Just science and engineering statistics. I think it's only STEM. Because there are certainly fields where women earn the vast majority. In yeah, that's why I was trying to like, are really like less than half of all fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, um, okay. I think this is strictly science and engineering. Yeah. Which is, admittedly, a shortcoming in the, in the key of that, of that slide. Should have been clearer. So, um, academic leadership. Um, when I saw this image of this amazing climbing structure, um, I'm trying to remember, I think maybe it's in Norway, I, I thought, wow, this just really represents the experience of coming into academic leadership. You, there are a lot of stumbling tripwires. You don't really know which way is exactly up or precisely which direction you're headed. You're kind of hanging on for dear life some of the time. Uh, so I found that very, very, very evocative particularly here coming in from another institution into the EDC role. There, there was uh, a lot to learn even about the words we use for things here. So, um, so I'll say a little about um, uh, gender and academic leadership and some of, the, some of the structures and how they impact things. So there aren't so many women in high positions in uh, academic leadership, particularly in STEM areas. And part of this is the pool that one is drawing from. Usually it's people who are relatively senior in the field who get considered for leadership positions. And there is, um, there, uh, well we've seen that women who are senior are already relatively rare, only 10% of the full professors in physics, for example. And there's also a consideration of um, along the way to getting there. Uh, there's data from, that the uh, American Institute of Physics c uh, collected through actually a survey, an international survey. It turned out this was true no matter what country you looked at, that women physicists had less access to resources of any kind of resource, money, space, students, opportunities to go to conferences, all of this stuff than men on average. Less access to resources means, it turns out to translate into slower career progression. So there are fewer years when you are senior and, and could be a candidate. And then along the way, um, uh, data shows that women in general professionally tend to have smaller networks if they're in a field where they're a minority. So there are fewer perhaps people who might be supporting them as potential leaders. Now there are also constraints. Um, you have to, to go into a leadership position, you have to be willing to see yourself as possibly in that job to apply for it in the first place. And if you're spending all of your time as a pioneer, as an only in the field, that may be enough to deal with in addition to just the regular day job, the aspects of teaching and doing research and so on, that you may have 
less time to sit back and think, well, where do I want to be in five years or 10 years? Do I want to go into a leadership position? And it may not occur to you to even think about that. Um, and then there's always the insidious imposter syndrome that, again, more, um, more prevalent uh, for women than men in our society, that feeling that despite all the stuff my CV says I did, I'm really just not worthy. I shouldn't even be here. Um, that kind of thing definitely keeps you from wanting to uh, you know, apply for something ambitious. But apart from whether women see themselves as possible candidates, there's also the question of will others help bring them along nurture them as future leaders nominate them. And here again is a place where um, implicit bias starts to come in again, because it turns out that um, mentoring, we tend to mentor those, uh, or be most enthusiastic about mentoring those whom we see as somewhat similar to ourselves in some way. So fewer women in the field, and maybe less access to some of the mentors who would be more powerful people in the field because of that. Uh, people in the field who are powerful, um, they, they came up through the system, it worked for them, and there's a temptation if you're not really sitting and reflecting on it, you might think, well, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get here, I got here, I made it, I guess the system works. And we might not always stop to think, well, the system worked for me, but would the system work for everybody? Um, and uh, we might not then think about, does the system need to change to be more fair for everybody? And uh, finally, some of the research, again, that, um, that uh, Linda Babcock, uh, who did the work on negotiation, some of her more recent work shows that when we think about, when you're interviewing people for uh, transition into some sort of a leadership position, if somebody's going to become a dean, Usually, they weren't a dean already. They've often been a department chair, an associate dean, or something like this. And so usually, you're not looking for somebody, when you're reading the, uh, the uh, application files, it's not usually somebody who's going to make a lateral move. They're going to have to make some sort of a leap up. And it turns out that all of us are more likely to believe that two people with identical, identical credentials were more likely to believe that the man could make the leap up than the woman. We're more likely to want the woman to have every single uh, box ticked among all of the impossible list of uh, credentials you're supposed to have to be a good candidate. But with the men, all of us, the women on the committee too, read it and say, well, look, you know, he's got half of them. And so, yeah, we think extrapolating, he can probably do a good job. And we're probably right about him. I mean, that's probably correct. But for her, we probably weren't giving her that same consideration. And it turns out that that same thing actually comes into the, will you apply? Will you see yourself as a potential leader? Because in reading the job description, the people in the majority are more likely to say, yeah, yeah, you know, I've done about half or two thirds of these things. I think I could learn the rest. And the people in the minority are more likely to say, ooh, I haven't done everything, I shouldn't apply. And so it's really interesting how you get these cycles going. So it can be very hard for, um, for people who are in the minority to even enter into leadership positions for all of these reasons. And if you look at the data, um, for example, from the uh, American Council on Education on uh, who, who are college presidents, and what was, this is about what was their prior job. Now the band up there in light gray is people whose prior job was not even in academe. So let's set that aside because that's completely unspecified. But for the rest of the circle, most of the circle, so most of the places that uh, a college president came from were either a president position or a, an EBC or provost position. But um, the uh, only, um, let's see, only about a third of college presidents, and at the moment at, um, at uh, research universities, less than a quarter of provosts are, uh, are women. So the jobs that are most likely to lead to the presidency have very few women in them. And then the jobs that are significantly less likely to lead to a presidency, those brightly colored ones, they like, uh, uh, chief diversity officer or dean or 
uh, university advancement. They have a lot more women, but it's harder to get to the presidency from there. So it's, um, uh, again, that issue of making the leap and just how likely is it that, that you're going to get that presidency, if that's what you want. I mean, many people have no interest in being a president because of what the job entails. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting data. Um, then if you think about what is the experience of leading in an academic setting? And uh, this part goes for everybody, just, just what it's like. So you come in and there are certain things you're supposed to accomplish and probably within a certain time frame you need to get these things done. However, um, you know, in a university, usually uh, as, as a leader, the people you're going to need to work with to get the thing done, most of them don't actually report to you. They probably report to someone else and you're going to need to partner with them and persuade them. Particularly if people you need to work with are faculty, they don't really work for anybody in a sense. And you're going to need to form partnerships through shared governance. And it's not a matter of ordering people around, it's convincing people that this thing is a good idea for all of us and we should do it together. So that's a very particular form of leadership or a set of boundary conditions on what being a leader even means. So your goals and the expectations on you from above are very clear. How you're going to get there? More murky and more partner built. Now you do have some uh, particular powers that you can draw on to uh, try to make progress. A big one, convening. If I ask somebody to come have a chat with me, there's a good chance they'll probably be willing to have coffee with me, sit down and talk for a while. And that's actually pretty powerful because it means that I can have conversations and learn from people and um, get their point of view and have a chance to maybe share my point of view. That's actually huge and it, it, can, it can lead to forming partnerships. The ability to set moral authority, um, to set expectations for what behavior of high integrity means in your organization, that can be pretty powerful too. You try to do that um, by example and by talking about it and by getting p other people to talk about it. And that can help shift the culture and help people be comfortable talking about that and thinking about what it implies for how we should do the work. So that's pretty powerful. And then just going out and spending time being somewhere with people and listening to them um, can, have, uh, can definitely have an impact. And so these are things that transcend gender. Any, any, any leader in academe will encounter these. However, if you're, um, if you're leading in academe uh, as, as particularly in STEM fields as a woman, so as somebody who's a minority within the field, there's extra scrutiny on what you do because on the one hand you're being examined for are you behaving like a proper leader, which means you should be visionary and focused and decisive and want to get things done for the good of the campus. But you're also being examined for are you being a proper woman? Are you behaving according to cultural norms? And those can be in collision because women aren't really supposed to be decisive and focused we're supposed to be deferential and we're supposed to want to do things for others and we're supposed to be quiet when somebody else speaks. So if we act the way a proper leader should, people may be uncomfortable that we're transgressing cultural norms, which is kind of interesting. So you have to, sometimes you can encounter um, very aggressive challenges because of that. Um, people may try to shout you down in your own office, an interesting experience. Um, uh, and it's important to have a um, kind of a, a set of tools to draw on. It's important to know, you've got to know the APM and the PPM in our language. You've got to know the rules. You've got to know the roles that different offices are supposed to play and be able to draw on those and the data because that can help establish authority for something that you're supposed to be trying to accomplish. It's important to build relationships with people in key areas around campus so that they know you will help them with their priorities, they will help you, you'll build partnerships, you'll try to get good things done together for the good of the students, for example, or to support research growth 
or whatever the priority is. You can try to build a strong reputation for keeping your word and for being somebody who will listen so that, um, and for being somebody who will explain the basis on which they make their decisions so that people know why and they don't fill in the blanks with, oh, it's because she doesn't really like the math department. Well, so you have to explain why is it that, uh, say, that all the new space the math department is getting is going to be in this building rather than that building, for example. One has to tell the reason so people will know. But on top of all of that, which you might say the first three, well, everybody, any leader has to do that. But there's a special expectation for women on relatability, on being nice, on being nurturing, on being kind, on being approachable. And while those are things, good things for anybody to do, there's a special expectation in our culture that women will do that. And it means, for example, um, uh, it means um, uh, in particular, there's a real danger if somebody wants to meet and you didn't meet with them, they could conclude two things, one of two things. They can conclude that you won't meet with them um, because you're afraid to, you're insecure. Now those things would be perhaps things that you would, ex how you would expect a woman to behave in our society, but boy, that's a bad look for a leader. So that's not a good way. Or they might conclude that you're just too proud to meet with them. You, you disdain them. That's not a great look for a leader, and boy, that's a really bad way for women to behave. So you need to, in the, in the relatability piece, you need to really be extra careful to meet with people and to show you do care, you, you are interested. There's that sort of extra expectation. Um, the fortunate thing is that doing that, it's simply good practice as a leader anyway. So it's important for, I think, that um, for those of us who are leaders at any level, and everybody, ha it, this doesn't come with title. We're each leaders in different roles that we play. We may lead in an organization. We may be the head of a committee. Um, we may be the head of all sorts of things. We need to just speak out openly about bias, about prejudice, because talking about it can lead to ways of resolving it and keeping it from running things. Um, it's, I've already talked about some of these structural ways to promote equity and so on. And we all need to identify people who are in the minority in our field who have the potential to become future leaders and make sure they know that we see that potential in them. So if it's something that they're interested in, they'll feel empowered to pursue it. I've tried to do a little work in that direction myself. Um, through leading a series of workshops for women in physics from developing nations. We lead this at the um, uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, and also some of its uh, um, related campuses in Rwanda and in uh, Bangalore, and Bangalore, India. And um, we, uh, so I run this together with um, a colleague from graduate school, Shobana Narasimhan, um, who's a condensed matter physicist, and um, uh, many colleagues uh, also help run these. We have about 50 or 60 women from uh, nations across Africa and Latin America, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe come and learn all the things that their mentors would teach them if they had mentors, but they're often the only woman in their university who is an early career faculty member or a postdoc. So they have less mentoring on average. Um, so we talk about CVs, about how to pick which journal to publish in, uh, how to negotiate, all, all those sorts of things. And a lot of them then go back to their countries and uh, to their institutions and run similar workshops using the materials. I've also, the uh, LGBT plus physicists uh, is a grassroots organization that whose work led to ultimately the APS climate report. So I've already talked about that. So to end, um, just a few thoughts about how all of us can promote diversity and inclusion in, in a variety of ways. The big one, support colleagues who are doing a lot of work on that. Even if you don't have time to do a lot of work on it yourself, there's going to be somebody you know who is. And your support 
will mean so much to them. So that one, that one is, really, is really huge. So the last two slides are just lists of resources. Those in green are things that I wrote or co-authored. So if you're tired of listening to me, you can avoid the ones in green. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the last one here is, um, that's the book chapter uh, from which the leadership part of this talk comes. So if there are specific references to that. Um, but let me stop there and take questions. So I think that diversity statements can be a great tool for people to talk about uh, what they have done to promote diversity and inclusion in however, in whichever aspects of diversity that speak most to them. And there are an infinite ways, infinite ways that they could take that to talk about what they've done in the past and what they've done in the future. I think we would all agree that society, particularly, U.S. society at this time would be better off if more people were science literate. So it's reasonable to say it would be good if we are, are all interested in educating a broader cross-section of the populace in science. And that inevitably means educating a more diverse group, because if you look around academe. So I think that they can really be extremely useful as a way of seeing, since that's an expectation of something that we should be doing as a public institution. It's a way of understanding, has a candidate thought about that much? How much potential do they have? Just as we look to them to write about their interests in research and their interests in, um, uh, in, in teaching. Because after all, all of these things appear on the, um, uh, the bio bib and, and all of the materials that one submits for academic promotion. So it's good to have consistency through, through the process. And I don't think it has anything to do with academic freedom. You're not telling people that they have to do research on a particular area. You're asking a very broad question. Absolutely, that's an excellent point, and there's really good, um, there's good, there is very strong data on that that's been um, generated, say, by, um, uh, there's a group at the, uh, UC, at the uh, UC uh, Hastings College of Law, for example, um, uh, Williams and Goulden, um, showing that women have, on average, I think it's, um, it's almost like a one full eight hours days less time per week to work on their academic, uh, their academic uh, research and career because of all the caretaking. Um, so there, I think it's really important that as an institution that we promote um, uh, family friendly, family supportive policies that can um, help with the burden of some of that for people of all genders, um, and that will help uh, women disproportionately, of course, because the burden tends to fall on them. So that's one reason why we have the new um, emergency backup child care system that uh, through Bright Horizons that you should be getting emails about. I think you've already gotten the first email to say, we understand that sometimes you have a sick child or maybe an elder in your family that you're responsible for caring for and their care falls through and you got to go teach. And so we want to help with those kinds of emergencies and so on, but also having um, parental leave. I think, um, I think just as citizens, we should also be working for greater societal attention to this. You compare us and most other countries in the developed world, we don't have good parental leave, we don't have good childcare systems, and it hurts everybody. So you're right, we should pay attention to that too. So 
so we have, this is uh, the first year we're doing it as a pilot program, and part of the pilot is to understand what percentage of people are going to use it and how big do we have to scale it. So we've started with um, ladder rank faculty and uh, teaching professors uh, as a pilot this year, and we'll then see uh, what the usage is and how we would scale it over time. So that's, that's where we've started from. Yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting question, right. Um, so women can definitely be pushed to, um, or encouraged to take on a lot of service roles. And um, sometimes that, um, so that, and that can certainly be part of what we saw where there were um, uh, significantly more women at the, um, in, in physics, I think 18% of the associate professors were women, but only 10% of the full professors. And so it can definitely impact career progression because if you're spending a lot of time doing committee work or you're pushed to maybe serve as department chair much earlier in your career, it can leave less time for research that would lead to promotion. So that definitely can happen. Um, it tends to happen though um, in ways that uh, don't necessarily help you progress to higher rungs in academic leadership if that's what you were interested in. Because if you want to become um, a dean or something, you generally have to have attained full professor and probably several higher ranks within full professor. And so the push to do a lot of service early can derail that. Um, we see that in, so as you probably know, one of, one of the parts of uh, my job actually that I enjoy the most is looking at the academic promotion files and uh, reading those, and um, there are definitely um, cases where the Committee on Academic Personnel and I are saying to, um, particularly, it happens a lot for junior career, for early career women, saying, you are doing fabulous service, but why don't you dial that back so you have more time for your scholarship to make sure you'll have a balanced portfolio for promotion. And so we do see that we do see that that happening. So I think it I think it um, differs it differs by field. There's um, some of it is due to a delay in getting the first academic position. There's uh, there's some of that um, uh, data from the uh, Hastings um, uh, group that that I mentioned showing um, uh, women, particularly with uh, young children in the house, definitely have a lower a lower probability. And then um, there is data on, well, so on women having less resources and that if you make it through the tenure bar, then okay, you got there. But then continually having less resources definitely impacts the rate of career progression. Um, it's, um, so again, that's something where on the one hand, um, having departments pay attention to having uh, you know, gender neutral policies and processes that will really treat people equivalently and having, um, uh, having um, uh, building up people's negotiation skills so when they have to ask for resources, there will be a good outcome. You need to work it from multiple angles. I, I, think, there, I think there's a question over here. Yes. Is 
so I've seen, um, I've seen some research talking about how at middle school, social factors come into play where the notion of, well also, little kids tend to also just all play together. And then you get to that somewhere between fourth and sixth grade, suddenly you see the boys hang out together, the girls hang out together. And along with that, there starts to be, and I'll, I'm saying s societal pressure, it's a habit. People start speaking to uh, kids at that age, and, oh, do you have a boyfriend? Oh, do you have a girlfriend? And this whole notion of, oh, boys don't like smart girls starts to come into play, apparently. And so girls say they feel pressure to not, if they're interested in school, to not display that for that reason. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what I've seen as, as um, written about as uh, a very significant factor. Now, there are probably multiple factors in there, of course. But that's certainly something that comes in at that age. Um, there's also some research, I think, showing how teachers respond differently to um, children of different genders, in particular, um, like behavioral issues. They may be more harsh with boys than with girls because um, uh, in, in certain situations. So there, there can be factors going both ways in how we're treating people at that age. Um, and of course, those are very important to teachers. They are. They are. That's right. And it can make you think, oh, this isn't a good thing for me to be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, in that case, uh, let us thank the 